Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Meepleville Meets. Today, we've got some of the uh, the two of the best guys in gaming. They happen to be brothers, got a fantastic YouTube channel, and you probably have seen them all over the board gaming world. But please welcome Nick and Mike, the brothers Murph. Hello, guys. Hello. hello. Oh, you if you don't know, cool. I'm Nick. That's Mike. Yeah. Just, it's good to no one ever knows who which one is which. This is fair. Like, so. Okay. We'll say hair. How about that? Yeah, hair. Oh, hair for Nick. <laughs> it's confusing, though, because when we first started, Mike had really long hair, and I had really short hair, Flipping and up. then we, we've we switched. And so, yeah, yeah, and so even that can be kind of confusing sometimes. But people know you for the hair At now. this point, yeah. It's, it's, been, been, a while. Hair. it's yeah. been a while. Yeah, yeah, so great. Thank you so much for coming uh, on of the course. show. Of course. Um, so the first thing I'd like to do for perhaps viewers who aren't familiar with you, never seen you before, if you could give me just a quick one or two minute kind of commercial elevator pitch USP of exactly who you are, what your channel okay. is, what your brand is, so that way people know. Awesome. Um, hair. Brothers Murph. <laughs> No, that's <laughs> we uh, we uh, started a YouTube channel and uh, we also live stream on Twitch and our whole kind of mission is uh, to be joyful participants in this hobby. That's our whole goal is to uh, celebrate the fun that board gaming can bring. And so we decided with a channel and with our live streaming, like let's just be joyful participants. Let's play board games, talk about the games mm -hmm. we love. We don't really do um many kind of classic reviews and things it's more really any, discussions yeah. about the hobby yeah. uh directions we like to see it go the games we love and why um all of those kinds of things and and our main asset that i think we bring to the table is that we are fun people uh we are enthusiastic it's we're true. optimistic um just naturally that way yeah, that's just and then we're brothers so we um also have the opportunity to kind of highlight uh, a really good friendship uh we've had a lot of people in the past say like you guys are actually brothers like you seem to get along is it it's all yeah let's really get along with the brothers to be fair we didn't for a long time it took us a while to get yeah, there it took us a while, right? yeah we also have really good chemistry because we're brothers which, yeah. which helps a lot but yeah it's just about just having fun in the hobby just having a good time, uh, you know, being inclusive. We want our whole thing is we want as many people playing board games in the world as yeah. possible. We don't care who you are. We want you playing board games. And so just trying to be open and bring people into the hobby and just have fun because the world a lot of times isn't that fun. And so, you know, board games can be kind of an escape. So yeah. that's that's kind of the whole thing. That's the yeah. goal. Yeah, very good. So um so good. You guys mentioned something about maybe at one point you were getting along, but you have you are now. You're, you have the chemistry and all that kind of stuff. So again, I know you two have known yeah. you for a couple of years now, yeah. and, stuff, and a lot of people do as well. However, don't really know necessarily a, a lot about maybe your history. So what I'd like to mm. to talk about is since your brothers, you know, just start off like where in the family do you fit? You know, the youngest, okay. the, oldest, the middle, who else? Brothers and sisters, and uh, so how about that dynamic to start? Sure, sure. Yeah. So we are just two uh, Murph four. siblings of four. Yeah. So I'm the oldest out of us all. Nick is the youngest Maybe, out of us yeah. all. We have another brother and sister in between us. Um, and uh, what is the age gap real quick? I'm sorry. What is the age gap? So we have, uh, it's me, my brother Chaz is a year younger than Rosie is a year younger and the Nick's a year younger. So yeah. we are kind of just perfect steps da, 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 down fishing. the line. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's three years uh, between Nick and I. Yeah. Um, so that's the biggest of the gaps and stuff. So this was something that as, th that's where kind of, you know, there was some level of tension maybe as younger people people three years when you're 11 to 14 is a pretty sizable difference yeah yeah you know what i mean both in terms of size and like, yes like you know <laughs> you're now you're not that i was able to bully you yeah exactly and that's the thing it's just like yeah, we were brothers brothers are mean to each other you know yeah. and, and we've it's gotten just, better yeah we've gotten great we hit it but yeah so like through a lot of like you know the 8 9 10 11 12 age Mike was kind of mean to me sometimes just because he's an older brother as old brothers do. And then like oh, I, trope. because was uh, I was like 10, took it really personally and really badly. And so I would get mad. We fight all the time. It's just like we're brothers. Like it's it's not honestly nothing. Right. Any, it's nothing like abnormal and it wasn't anything bad. Like it's not like you was like this horrible. It's like, no, he was just an older yeah, brother. It's what older brothers do. Like we're just in each other's hair a lot. Older siblings are right. mean to their younger siblings. That is one happens in 100% of families. I'm not proud of that fact. But no, but it's fine. But he, <laughs> there's no shame. Like I don't have a problem with it. Like that's how right. it always happens, you know? And that's so important. it's like, it's one of those things. Like it doesn't bother me at all. It's like, and so we, 
So we, it's this weird thing where Mike's three years older than me. So we are always, we are always just out of the age range to hang out. So basically like when yes. we were in, when we were in uh, elementary school, the first through third graders had a lunch and then the fourth through sixth graders had a lunch. So when I hit first grade, Mike was in fourth grade. Yeah. So we were at different lunches sure. together. Then once I got to fourth grade, Mike was in middle school. And so we were at different schools. By the time I got to middle school, Mike was in high school. So we we're at different schools. So we never ever got to hang out at school. We line up ever. Yeah. And be ever. Fierce. And so once we both got to high school, yeah. we went to the same high school for a semester Then I ended up moving to a different high school. But we are finally able to be at school like together. Mm -hmm. And we're a little and bit older by the, this point. Yeah. And the second I hit like freshman year of high school, we became super close. And we still, of course, would fight sometimes, but it was just like it, it like changed overnight. It really did. It yeah. was this weird thing where, uh, you know, I was a senior in high school and then Nick kind of could hang with my friends and stuff. And we all were just kind of school. chilled yeah. out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, like, I don't know, it just got easy. And yeah. then um, since then, it's just become tighter and tighter, yeah. you know? Okay, yeah. so then what about what about like your family life then? So including the other siblings and mm -hmm. uh, the parents, whether you had one or two, I don't know, but you know where you grew up. What was your life growing up, and like where did you grow up? Yeah, so we grew up uh, in Sacramento, California. Sacramento, this is Northern California, California, California now, in Southern California, so far away. Um, <laughs> so it was like might as well be. Yeah, it was a very <laughs> kind of classically '90s childhood where. Uh, in Sacramento being a smaller town, um, with kind of some city feel, I remember growing up, we thought like Sacramento is like this big city and then we're like, Oh it's no, not. it's, it's nothing. It's uh, not a small, to be fair. It's not a small city. It's not a small, it's like 500,000 people. Yeah. That's not a small town. It is a medium sized city. Fair enough. It's a medium sized city, but it had some small town kind of it, feel. it feels. Yes, yes. Yeah. And so being in the nineties, I mean, we were those, uh, we, we kind of always consider it like the last generation of kids who grew up outside yeah because you kids know, don't grow outside anymore yeah. there wasn't nearly as much to do inside and and we had those summers where our mom would say like hey you can go Get out, out of my house. with all the neighborhood kids yeah. come back you know. at sunset yeah, yeah come back at sunset the hose is out there you got water and stuff and we had bikes and we were just that kind of pack of kids on bikes that would be at any one of our neighbor's house at any one time yeah. but it was a really cool way to grow up because we um, we're able to develop uh, social skills, problem solving skills, all those things, because we were, we had to figure stuff out yeah. as kids, because maybe we'd come into, you know, it'd be over some game or something. We're all playing outside and we don't like the rules and everything. So we had to learn how to kind of be with people, uh, which I think was a blessing really. Yeah. So, um, you know, our childhood was just, we were, playing sports and stuff like that. We were always uh, enrolled in after school activities to keep yeah. us busy, uh, Boy Scouts, uh, doing music, uh, theater and stuff eventually, a ton of stuff. Yeah. We were always doing something different, I feel like. Yeah, it was always, we were always doing stuff. Yeah, we kept busy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well then, so, um, and I'm still, I'll get to this a lot later, but I'm just trying to like, you know, you yeah, know, of course, how you guys grow up and stuff, but you're in doing this now is uh, kind of uh, your life, your livelihood or whatever. Mm -hmm. But what are maybe... What did you maybe want to do um, mm. maybe when you were in high school? What was your sort of dream career path? You know, and I'm not talking about being Batman or something. Something yeah, really yeah, yeah. like what did you really want to do? Sure. Um, for me, there was kind of a couple of paths. The first one, uh, when I was younger, uh, right up until I got to high school, actually, I wanted to be a firefighter. Like I always like, grew up idolizing firefighters. I thought they were like just these heroes and still do. But, you know, like I was like, I'm going to do that. Uh, and then I got to high school and I started doing theater and about halfway through high school, I had a really great mentor, uh, Miss Phi, who um, kind of took me aside at one point and said, like, you could do this. Like, yeah. you, you could follow this dream if this is something you wanted to do. And I kind of was like, huh, acting. OK, that might be kind of cool. So from that point, my life shifted and yeah. um, I went to college, I went to UCLA in their theater program and stuff like that. And that moved me down to Los Angeles and I started doing uh, commercial auditions and things and had some success and, um, and all of that. And then, uh, so that was kind of my, my path early on. And then uh, things kind of naturally shifted to doing what we do now, which is interesting because like I get to use all my acting skills and filmmaking skills and all these things are coming back, but just in a way that I never yeah, totally. could have seen. But how about for you? Yeah, I never really had a dream. Shouts out to all the people that who don't have dreams. Um, <laughs> You're not a solid. No, no, but I, don't, I, I mean, I'm not joking. I'm not joking about that. Shouts out to the people out there who don't have a dream because not everyone has, like you have a very, I, talk, I, was, I, I happened to talk about this on my, I was streaming yesterday playing mm. uh, 
playing a video game and we were talking about this. It's like you had a dream. Like you wanted to be an actor. You came down to LA to mm -hmm. be an actor. Like I never had that really. Like I've never had like a legit dream. And I think there's a lot of pressure in the world to have a dream, like a concrete, like I want to be a doctor. I want to be, an, really I want to be an astronaut. But, but even through like high school, like you're asked at 13, like what do you want to be for the rest of your life? And okay. you're 13. You're the dumbest you've ever been. <laughs> And it's like, it's, it's one of those things where like, I, I vehemently disagree with the concept of like, you have to know what you want to do with the rest of your life at sure. the age in high school. And so like, and especially like for me, like I never had like a concrete dream of like what I wanted to do, where I wanted to go to school, all this kind of stuff. And when you don't have a dream, there's like a lot of guilt that comes along with it sure. where like, you're like, well, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? What's your dream? What's your dream? And I'm always like, I don't know. Like, I just like, like my thing I've always like, do I like making stuff with you. Yeah, yeah, that's what we've always we've done. Always like when we we had a, a weird child because both of our parents are luckily in recovery now for over twenty years, but they were alcoholics, addicts, and stuff like that. So a lot of times they weren't around. So we would always just create stuff. Mm -hmm. Like we'd make little home movies and stuff. We were always creating stuff. Building and so stuff. that's all I ever really liked doing was just making stuff and creating stuff. Like I do art, all this kind of stuff. But I never wanted to go to school for art. I never wanted to be a professional artist. I danced in high school. I did ballet and modern and stuff. I loved it. Even was trying to go to college for it. Didn't end up working out. But then I'm looking back and I'm like, yeah, I'm glad I didn't get into college for mm -hmm. it because I definitely didn't want to do that first. You're kind of driving toward your dream without knowing. It. Yeah, and so like my thing is like I just like performing, like, and I don't really care what medium that takes place, whether I'm performing in the way of a drawing or I'm performing in the way of like on stage in a musical or a play or dancing or talking about board games and being silly on the internet. Like this to me is like what I've always I think wanted to do was just create stuff and mostly create stuff with Mike, but I've never had like a concrete dream. So again, shouts out to people who don't have dreams <laughs> because it's okay. Because it's okay. If you it don't have a dream, it. it's fine. Right. Don't no, feel guilt over that. It's fine. That's true. Yes, I get what you're saying and I, and I fully understand and I get it, but um, there is something that, I, that I'd sort of like to talk about that you brought up, which I, I find is very uh, interesting. Mm -hmm. So uh, you, you alluded to the fact that uh, both of your parents had uh, struggled with addiction yeah, or certain yeah. things in their life. So uh, maybe to help people who are watching and viewers, how did that shape you and how did that affect you and maybe a little bit of how you ever overcome it? Were, were games a way for you maybe to escape or how did that, again, just sort of, how did it affect you? How did you overcome it? And what would maybe, maybe your advice, how other people that may be watching who have the same situation can maybe learn from you guys? Yeah. It, um, you know, it's, it was tough, you know, it's tough. And we yeah. have work that we are doing now as, as grown people to kind of sort through everything. And, and, uh, and all of that, but it, you know, the one thing that I, uh, the big takeaway that, that we take is a, like we're super grateful that we still have both of our parents because the reality with a lot of people you know, alcohol and addiction is not everybody makes it. So we we got both of our parents. Yeah. Um, they both, I mean, our, our, their, our dad's about to hit 20 years. Our mom's at 22 years. Yeah. So, so yeah, yeah, they're doing fine. And we had it for the majority of our life. They've yeah, been sober now, point, which yeah. is really cool. So the thing that was really amazing was, um, I think as part of what happened when we got older, we realized that while we kind of, you know, would butt heads as when we were younger, there was probably some amount of that was dealing with pressure from not having all the stability. Not having uh, parents around. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of what made us tight. So, um, the main thing you can do to kind of work to get through that stuff is to find an ally. You know, we had each other yeah. and we would always create things. And so like our situation led to this beautiful sense of creativity that we have and will always have with us. We would again, create all these home videos and we would splice stuff from movies. We like loved movies. Um, and we would like splice stuff together to make it seem like we were in a scene or we would create some game for ourselves or some sort of imagination, some story. Um, everything that happened in our life led to this moment right here, right now, yeah. because now we're working together, still creating stuff, still the same goofy kinds of things. And we've been able to find an audience that, um, resonates with that. They enjoy our weird humor or whatever Some reason they do. Yeah. Um, yeah. And games are a great way to do that as well, because it gives you something for your brain to work on a puzzle, a bit of escapism. Mm -hmm. um, so we always kind of played like board games and stuff, all the old classics and things. We didn't know what world, yeah, games, what were, world games weren't a big part of our childhood at all. Yeah. Other, but again, we had like, sorry. Yeah. But it was, like we didn't that. play them very often though. We did. I feel like we did. Yeah. But. <laughs> okay. Nick's Nick is <laughs> we did. changing my reality. Sorry. No, 
that's fine. Dude, at least my reality, my reality was, I don't know, we never really played games, but yeah, no, we no, kind of no, create games. our own games and stuff. Yeah. So, um, yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean, in terms of, I mean, advice, I don't know, it's 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 tough because every situation is different, and mm-hmm. and you're the the in the end, it's like, I guess the only thing I can really say is just like have an ally, like Mike said, like have a support system, mm-hmm. have some kind of escapism, not completely, like don't escape complete. You know, there's, there's a, a point of escaping where you're just ignoring stuff and that's not good either. Sure. But then just like, just be there when the person's ready to get help. Like in the end, you can only control yourself and the person won't get better until they're ready to get better. No matter how much you try and make yeah. them get better. If they're not ready, they're not going to do it. It's just, yeah. I, mean, I worked at a rehab for six years. So like I constantly watch people who weren't ready you know, mm-hmm. and a lot of them are gone now, you know, and that's, that sucks. You, you know? also but found like, a lot of people that were, yeah. And, and it's like, you just, the main thing is like, be ready for when they're ready. That's mm-hmm. what I would say is like, it's like, if they're not ready yet, they're not ready yet. No, right. no amount of love or anything you can give them is going to make them ready until they're ready. So be ready once they're ready. Yeah. The worst yeah. thing that can happen is they're finally ready. And then you are not yeah, there, you, you know what I mean? So it's like acceptance of who they are and where they yeah, are. It's just in that like, be ready when they're ready. That's that's yeah. me. Other than that, it's like there's it, the problem with addiction, particularly. It's like there's nothing you can do. Like yeah, you can't change them, you know. So it's like they they have to do it. They have to do the work. So it's like the only thing you can do is love them, don't shame them, and be ready when they're ready. And mm-hmm. that's that's like all you can do. It's that's the worst part of addiction. You can't do anything about it. <laughs> like yeah, right. no, that's like. Definitely- yeah, that's very good advice, and I appreciate you guys uh, sharing that because it yeah. is true. I think the two most important things, like uh, uh, Mike said, is to l- have an ally, mm-hmm. and like Nick said, be ready when you're ready. Because I just want to make clear and, and get the point across because that there are people out there who, whether it's yourself suffering from addiction or maybe family members like you guys did, but there is help and things be- can yeah. be okay. So there are yeah. people out there willing to help you, right? Yeah. Yeah. And there's, there's no, you know, um, there's, there's no distance you can go and not recover from yeah. and come back. Like we've known people both, uh, through, you know, friends of our parents who they've met in recovery through your work and stuff, people who, you know, were way out there who have done things that they're not proud of or whatever it might be. And now they're back here they've got their stuff together. I mean, they had people that were working at the rehab now who have like clawed their way from the depths and stuff. And yeah. it's an amazing thing to see, you know what I mean? So like when we look back at our parents, it's like, sure, we have some baggage because of some of the things that went on. Yeah. But like, I'm nothing but grateful for and proud. I wouldn't so change it. Proud yeah. It made us who we are. Yeah. Like what they, what they were able to do. Yeah. I wouldn't trade it. Um, and also, know, yeah. Yeah, within our own community, as you guys are well aware of, we have such a wonderful community. So if any yeah. of our if any of our community is out there, okay, you have somebody like Nick who actually worked in the field um, to maybe help you or do whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, Mike willing to be an ally. I'm an ally. So anybody course, yeah. in our community, board game community, please reach out to us. Yeah, there are always people who care. Be there for you, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. There's exactly. always there's always someone out there who cares about you enough to help. There always is. It may not feel yeah. like it, but there always is. Yeah, you might just have to look for them. We're lucky yeah. to have a really strong sense of community with this hobby because yeah. it literally brings people together. You have I mean, to play games with people. Yeah, talk about having allies and people. Yeah, like this hobby will will treat you right. Yeah. It yeah. really does. So yeah, so now, yeah, that's good. And thank you guys very much for sharing that. I really of course. appreciate that. So that we're pretty open about it. It's, it's our lives. <laughs> yeah. right. So sort of right now getting into this. Um, so I feel a little bit proud uh, because um, I do know that MeepleCon was your first board game convention. Right, yes, it was. was. Shouts out to MeepleCon. That's right. <laughs> oh, <Big> yeah. <laughs> and in case you guys don't know out there, MeepleCon was a convention that Dave and I started. Um, we ran it for four years, and then it turned into Dice Tower West. Right. And we partnered up with Tom from the Dice Tower. But so what I'd like to know then is how did you get – to MeepleCon, what brought you two together? Because Nick, you had alluded to the fact that you didn't really play a whole lot of gamers, not a ton, yeah. gamers when you were kids. Yeah, but yeah. What evolved with you two and games to get you to MeepleCon? Good question. Yeah, it's Nick, it's kind of a, to thank, really. Yeah, I mean, I guess kind of. Yeah, I, I was definitely more into games. I I kind of dragged him into the hobby, and then and you then showed me the way, and I, I feel like I walked my own steps. Yeah, but yeah, maybe we were both on. brought in by by one person ultimately. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so like we played games as kids. It was like sorry, a couple of mass marks, but it, it wasn't like every weekend. It wasn't like we weren't big gamers. Yeah. Um, at least I I I, goes, I wasn't at all. Yeah. I don't I don't have. We any certainly weren't aware of what was no. out there. 
So, I mean, we didn't start like, I would say playing games until we were adults. I had a, I had a girlfriend and her family loved games. Yeah. They loved D and D they loved board games, um, big, big gamers. And one, at one time they sat me down to play pandemic and I was the first modern game I had played ever. I'd never played anything else. And I was like 20, 20 at the time. So about yeah. 10 years ago. And so, um, wow, that's, that's it. Um, and so uh, <laughs> we all years. get older. I was 10 years ago. Yeah, I was 10 years ago. So um, so she I so we played Pandemic with her, and I was just like, what? Like I'd never played anything even remotely like that, obviously. And 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 I was just like, what is this? And then we all spent uh New Year's Eve at her place yeah, with yeah. her family, and so we played Pandemic again, and that's what started us. We were like, we gotta get this game, and we me and her all night. We played it all we just night, kept playing over and over again. We we're kind of like, woo, it's new year, and then we just kind of kept playing. It was really fun. And then um, a couple of years later, we ended up breaking up. Um, but I always, I always shout out oh, to man. Kira because man, she started. She literally is like the reason that we're yeah, here is because of her. <laughs> so um, eventually, I moved down to. Uh, we played Pandemic a couple more times with that, but I eventually moved down to LA just to be with Mike. Ultimately, um, I didn't really have another reason to be here other yeah, than just wanted a change of scenery. Yeah, yeah, just wanted to move out of Sacramento, and I wanted to be with Mike, and so um, I just moved down here. Um, and so we got Pandemic. Played it a butt ton, and then we got a cut like one or two other games. We got Catan. We, got Catan. we eventually got Zombie Side because my my now roommate told me about it. Um, and then we had those three games for mm -hmm. like, oh, like a year and a half, two years or so, and we three. just played like those three. And then we st I wanted to start painting Zombie Side because it's a minis game, right? And so I started like looking up painting tutorials. Started watching this uh, wonderful woman named Girl Painting. Your channel's Girl Painting on YouTube. Look her up; she's amazing. And I started watching her stuff, and then I eventually found moved on to someone named Sarastro who had um, specific painting guides on zombie sites. So I started watching those, and then in like the recommended column, there was like Dice Tower, Rado, a couple other people, and so I started watching Rado stuff and started learning about some new games, and then eventually. And every single recommended week was the Dice Tower, Dice Tower, Dice Tower. All roads lead to the Dice Tower. And so I eventually started watching the Dice Tower stuff. And then as I kind of started getting into like watching Rod on the Dice Tower, then like the well opened up and I just, boo, you just go in. Because then you find Board Game Geek, you oh. find also, and then it's just like, we started buying more games. <laughs> and then we eventually won Christmas was like, we had some extra money because it was Christmas. And we we're like, let's just buy like 10 games. So we did a bunch of research, yeah. buy like 10 games. That's when we bought like Viticulture, Dungeon Pets, a lot of the games we still have. Yeah, Eclipse. Yeah. Eclipse, yeah. A lot of these games that we still have and still love. Um, And and then once we did that, that big buy, it was then over. Then it was on. It was then, over. Then we were like looking for like what new games are coming out. What's shelves, going on? We started on buying shelves for games. Yeah, it started getting real yeah. bad. Yeah. Yeah. And so we, I can't remember, how did we get to actually MeepleCon because you definitely Meeple, made it's that because happen. the Dice Tower goes to MeepleCon. Yeah, so they were um, mentioning and now it's Dice Tower West, but the Dice Tower would always go to MeepleCon yeah, because we heard great the things. Gamma Trade Show used to be in Vegas, and That's so right. it was a convenient thing because all these publishers and the Dice Tower would go to Gamma, and then cleverly Tim and all them would have MeepleCon the next weekend, and so they would just go boom right over MeepleCon. And so I was just like, oh, it's it's local for because there's no real big conventions in LA, and so we were like, oh, it's local enough because it's Vegas, close enough. And and then the Dice Tower guys were there, so I was like, I wanted to go see like Tom and all. Go geek out on the Dice yeah, Tower, yeah, you know. And so basically, I just want to stare at him from across the room and be all weird about it. Um, and so that's I think that's how we went. We were like, let's go to a con. I've always, we've always wanted to go to board game con. We really like board games, and this is one that's like nearby. We also like going to Vegas. Like Vegas yeah. is cool. And then we were like, and then like the Dice Tower guys will be there. And you didn't even widely watch the Dice Tower at that point. No, I mean I knew who they were because I was the main researcher and yeah. looker up of games. Nick, Nick was the keeper of the keys. Yeah, so I was just uh, you know so let him do the work, and I got to play the games. And then we oh, got right. there, and about like a week after MeepleCon that year, Tom put a call out on Board Game Breakfast for new contributors, basically yeah. saying like, hey, if you have an idea for a thing for Board Game Breakfast, I told Mike and. We had been wanting to do something creative. You know, we were both right, right, right. working at the rehab. Mike was doing other working. You were working the night job at that point, right? Yeah. Yeah. I was working nights. Um, and so we were just uh we were just like, let's and I was like, you know what? Just you want to do something movie. for this like board game channel? We like board games. So then we pitched an idea to Tom and, and he said sure. And then we started doing that, and now it's both of our full-time jobs. Yeah. Nice. Okay, well then so what was so when you got to MeepleCon, right? Because this would have sort of been the first event for you outside of just at a kitchen table or in yeah, yeah. House, right? Yeah, 100%. Big time. Yeah. 
Okay, so when you got into the community, and I'm not talking, you know, about MeepleCon itself, but just being in a room with like probably at that time maybe four, five, six hundred other gamers. Yeah. What was that like for you to all of a sudden real? Oh, there's my cat. She woke up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love it. We had, to, we had to put our dogs out of the room because they're like, yeah, they're gonna start fighting. Oh, yeah. Oh, are they gonna hear her? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she always makes a guest appearance. Uh, okay. yeah, yeah. Uh, Hi. <laughs> but once you got into that community, what was it like all of a sudden now? You're like, wow, I'm part of this community. All these people have the same interests. We're like-minded people. You got to see Tom. You got yeah. to you know, meet the Dice Tower. All this kind of stuff. What was that like? I, I mean, it was super cool. It was really cool. Like, first, uh, you know, MeepleCon was such a cool, I think, perfect first convention yeah. because yeah it was very chill very relaxed very open it's just game welcoming yeah. yeah um it was it was super cool because you're playing your games and you're sort of the in vibes a, yeah you're just sort of on your own doing it's just thing. cool because when you play a game you get so tunnel vision yeah, yeah you're yeah. playing you're just doing this you're playing a game but it's so cool to eventually be like oh my god there's 800 people yeah, yeah. playing games it's just like it, it and that still happens at cons i yeah. get that way where i'm like i'm playing a game and i look around i'm just like this is mm. so cool yeah. And that for the first time was like, like, I mean, don't get me wrong, I think we still would have gotten very deep into the hobby had we not gone to MeepleCon, but it was such a cool experience to be there yeah. with so many other people playing board similar games. interest to you. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, it was just, it was amazing. It was yeah. Incredible. And it was just so fun the first time, like walking around and just seeing so many different groups of people all playing different games. So like in a flash, you're going to see for relatively new gamers, I've seen yeah. so many new games that all I was doing was like, What's that? Nick again was the research. He's like, oh, that's New York Slice. I'm like, oh, what's that? He's like, oh, that's that. He's like, oh, what's that over there? He's like, I don't know what that one is. So yeah. what's that one over there? You know, um, it was, it was a just incredibly exciting yeah. experience. And because the vibe was so good, it really endeared us to the idea of going to conventions, to um, wanting to seek out the community at large, like participate in a bigger you know, the, uh, the community in a bigger sense other than just us playing some games yeah. at home together. Um, so like that was one of the biggest, best thing that could have happened for us. I yeah. think. Yeah. Really though. Yeah. So cool. cool. Yeah. Because, and then you said that, you know, you did that call. Cause I do remember that call that Tom put out looking for contributors and all this yeah. kind of stuff. And that seemed to be a perfect marriage for you guys. Right. Because you both were very creative. Uh, Mike, you had the film experience and all that kind of stuff from studying at UCLA and everything. And then yeah. you decided just to go ahead and put one out. Now, before we get into this, like this next segment about you guys and your content creation and what you want to do, I, I really want you guys to focus on and, and, and kind of reiterate as we're going through this to a lot of people out there, because since, and I've even started it too, since the content, cre uh, since the COVID, the pandemic, yeah, of course, people are doing content creation, getting this stuff. But I really want to emphasize how much work you guys do want to put into it. Because again, I just a lot of work. It is. It really is. I just want people to always be aware from that, aware of that, that you're not overnight successes. You didn't just pop up yeah. all the time and effort. So from the call out to Tom and then you guys doing it, where was all of a sudden the point where you guys were like, hmm. I see that this could be a possible way to make an income. We do really love it. And what was that decision process to sort of say, okay, let's let's try to get into this and do this maybe as a profession? Yeah, it was. Uh, I mean, you're right. Like it takes uh, work, work yeah. and then time yeah. to, to get places. I mean, a lot of the folks like Tom, Rodney and all them, they – didn't start doing this last year. They've been in it, doing for, it for a, a decade. Time. It's like, yeah. Yeah. So I think that was one thing that was kind of nice for us was at the start, we were just having fun. Yeah. We're all dead inside now. Yeah. It's but great. at one time we had fun. No, yeah. we still have fun, but you know what I mean? It was just for like, for kicks because yeah. we like doing creative stuff. There wasn't any plan to make it more than just doing yeah. stuff in the dice tower. Yeah. And I think that's what led to our success is because we were always doing, um, projects and things that were interesting to us we were we were being led through joy and passion and because we didn't think there was an income to be made um and so by doing that we kind of started um gathering a little bit of a following because people kind of liked our energy that's the one thing that people come back to time and time again our energy they really like our energy um so we just kind of leaned into that and as a result uh like restoration games before we even had a thousand subscribers um said hey like we because we would do thrift store throwback segments on the dice tower we kind of do retro stuff they bring back old games they said like this seems like uh something that could kind of pair well um 
and we're looking for someone to sponsor. So we were able to get a sponsor and now we had access to some of these conventions because they would bring us along to work yeah. their booth. You know what I mean? And so everything kind of happened organically. And then as things kind of built up, we started hitting this point where we had the ability to make some money. Um, we are live streaming by this point, which created an audience that yeah. can support us um, and things like that. And then Nick actually fatefully, we found out, got laid off from his job. Yeah. The rehab that he worked at for a long time. They closed down. Closed down with like a month's notice, like right? Two weeks. They gave us two weeks. Yeah, notice. that's right. Yeah. They gave him like, two, we were we were about to go to Dice Tower East, like literally yeah. two weeks before. Yeah. No, 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 seriously, like the day, the day my work closed. It was the first day of Dice Tower East or something like it that. It was, yeah, it was like, I think, yeah, I don't know. It was the day they closed, the next day is when we left to Dice Tower East, which yeah. we were going to anyway. Like, that wasn't because of that. It was yeah. just, yeah. Um, and it was so, a good way to start unemployment. I'm not going to lie. I mean, it's a fun way. Yeah, right? it was a fun way. Um, but the thing is that that what that gave us was the opportunity to, um, we said, hey, like, you have some time. We have a little bit of money saved up and things. Um, let's let's try to keep Nick not working yeah. for as long as we can. Yeah. Let's see if we can. Well, not working a normal job. Right, right, yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, not having yeah, to go yeah, to yeah. a normal job. Um, I don't do anything. And so that's when we kind of started to make a real go for it. We said, yeah. like, we have this window of opportunity. If Nick can dedicate all of his energy into what we do here, live streaming the channel, reaching out to publishers, doing a lot of admin work, can we create some opportunities for ourselves? And because he was able to give more time and more energy to it, we were able to start creating those um, opportunities. And mm -hmm. we hit another turning point uh, this time last year where um, we said, like, I think if we give even more energy, if I can give 100% of my time to this, I think we can make it work. Yeah. So let's try it with both of us. And we did it. And we are here a year later, knock on what it continues. Yeah. Um, but there was those moments, but it was all organically built. It yeah. all kind of was just from us doing fun stuff and people responding to well, that I and think, us leaning in further. I think there was also like the, the realization that, uh, there was, there's kind of a gap and I think this gap is now being closed, which I think is a good thing. And I think it's being partially closed by us, partially closed by people like Paula Deming, Matthew Jude, a lot of these other people where it's like a lot of board game media content, especially in a couple of years ago, most of it's and is information based. It's just this is the game. This is how it's played. This is my opinion on it. End of video, which is fine. And there's yeah. a lot of people like I personally like those kinds of videos because that's what I'm interested in. But there wasn't much like board game entertainment or at least right. videos with an where entertainment is the first focus. And that's what we're good at. Yeah, you know, so there's no point in us being like this is the game. This is how it plays. This is how what I think of it because a lot of other people are doing that. So we're our whole thing was always like we need to be doing something different, and we think that there's a gap that we could fill mm -hmm. in this. And I think we have. So I think somewhere in somewhere in there, I'm not entirely sure if there's a concrete moment, but the realization that like oh, there's a gap here that we can we have something fill. to provide. We have something that we could provide that's different. And that is missing in the board gaming hobby. And now there's a lot more, I would say, entertainment first kinds of things, yeah. which I think is good because I think that's the main thing in board game media content our hobby has been missing. Mm -hmm. And now it's being filled by some really wonderful, amazingly talented people. Yeah. Um, well, shows like this where it's it's about learning about the people. Yeah, and it's about the conversation. The it's about, yeah, it's about the hobby as a whole, not like, this right. is Scythe. I like Scythe. Bye, you know. So, yeah, so let me ask you, because I don't want to get too far, because I want to kind of keep the things in thought. So yeah. it's real interesting. When you guys made the decision, as you said, Mike, where you're like, okay, Nick got laid off. Yeah. Let's see if we can have him do this full time to go there. Now, um, um, I want to try to get into the dynamic, because all of a sudden, and I guess I'll start with you, Nick, because all of a sudden it's like, oh, okay. Uh, we're in this together. Mike says it's okay, but I've got no money coming in. I've got to sort of like carry this burden to make sure it's successful because Mike is essentially funding it. And correct me if I'm way off base there, but you know what I mean? So I'd like to start with you on that part, Nick. Yeah. What was that burden like? If you if you guys are saying, okay, we're going to do this, but I have to be the driving force because I have nothing to do, only this. You know what I yeah. mean? So, so what was that like? It was, it was interesting. I feel like I should have felt more pressure than I did. Um, it's it's like it was very difficult. We don't, we still don't make much money. Honestly, it's like this, this. It's not like, you know, uh, we're not fat cat living. But um, it's it's there was. 
I, I don't know. I, just, I guess I didn't feel enough pre- that much pressure because like, I always felt like, because we were all we were on that that brink for a while. We were like, could one of us go full time? Could could we start? Like we're we're getting somewhat close, probably for around six months or so, where at least we were having the conversation. So like I was pretty sure that we could make it work. One, we're, we've also just been poor most of our adult lives. <laughs> it helps if you're we live in story. L.A. You know, it's like we're we've, we've been the whole ramen and hot dogs meals uh, three yeah. times a day for we've we've lived that life many different times. Um, and so it's like, I wasn't so much worried about the money as I was like, I guess it's like letting the whole thing just, just knowing that, like, I guess I was more worried that like, we were wrong that like Mm. that our, what we're bringing to the table is something that people want enough for us to do this like as a job you know because it's one thing if we do a couple videos here and there you know and people tolerate us or whatever you know it's like i think that was more of my pressure than so much like the money or like we gotta make this work i was i I wasn't i we've always had a pretty strong belief in ourselves and what we bring at least creatively and so like i always think i had that i was more worried that it wasn't so much our ability as just that people weren't gonna want that which is fair too it's like you know not that it's no we're not entitled to anything you know and so um i I probably should have been more worried but i kind of wasn't and it's also because it was like it was one of those things where like i was also in a relatively good position now again this is all pre-covid and stuff like that because i was like look i worked at a rehab for six years i could walk into a rehab job yeah anywhere and there we're in la there's a lot of rehabs there's one every 10 feet so it's like so i i had a very very easy to easy to go to backup it felt it felt um not as high risk no it did because i was like well here's the thing if we go for a couple months in and we're screwed because i have no money like i'll just go to rehab and start working again like it's it's so it's I, I, yeah, I guess it wasn't as much pressure as I thought it was going to be. Maybe, maybe for okay, the better. No, maybe for the better, yeah. <laughs> better, no, absolutely. So then also, I guess um, the, this next question I'd like to ask is since Mike was the one who went to school, sort of maybe had the more um, schooling in like the film the art and all that part, even though you're brothers and you are a team and it is a collaboration, can you let us know? how it balances is one more of a driving force in this aspect, the other part, or how does your collaboration with each other work? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, we, we kind of realized that I think early on um, we're both incredibly creative people, Mm -hmm. but our um, artistic flares have driven in different directions. Like I'm more of the theater performing arts, acting stuff. Nick is more visual artists and stuff. So we kind of realized early on Um, especially as we started to grow and started uh, to grow our ideas of things we could do and stuff and things we want to do, dreaming big and whatnot, uh, we kind of have realized uh, that we are Walt and Roy Disney. Yeah, that's always the comparison. Yeah, through learning about the Disneys and stuff, you learn that these are two brothers that are running this business and Walt Disney is this dreamer. He would have all these crazy ideas and stuff and then Roy Disney was the kind of the pragmatic like, like savvy person yeah. said, Hey, Walt, we're on the brink of bankruptcy. We can't do that. Or we have to do it this way. And Walt says, we're doing it anyway. So, you know, um, we've always kind of realized that we fall into that where Nick is really good at handling a lot of the admin, um, keeping up with publishers, uh, keeping schedules sensible and making things make sense. And um, that frees me up in some ways to, um, be kind of more loosely creative and Nick kind of figures out how we can do that a little bit. And I think it's worked out for the most part. So that's why Nick's not creative because no, no, not at all. But I, I'm, I've never been like the ideas guy. I always say like, I'm not the ideas guy. I'm the guy you tell your idea to. And he makes it actually, and then I'll make it happen. happen. That's what I'm good at. And that's what I like to do anyway. Like I have some ideas, but you've always been like, Oh, we should do this and this and this. And I'm always like, Oh, good. Great. Yeah. We cool. This is this is maybe well. how we could do that. Whereas I, if I'm the one who has to like come up with the ideas, I just like I can't yeah. very well. So, so I'll, I'll kind of default to like writing and stuff. If we're doing something comedically driven, I'll kind of take it there, and then Nick finds ways to make it make sense. Like we have a, a we're in these shirts because we do a, a silly kind of satirical news show, uh, and Nick will make all these cool. Like I'll have this weird idea, and Nick's like, "Oh, I can make that. I can Photoshop this and create this and draw on this thing." and 
you know, uh, now we have this amazing whimsical thing. So that's the dynamic. It's really, it's, it's but the whole thing is written and edited yeah. by you. Yeah. But it's, I don't do it. I just show up. Creative creative energy that gets yeah. bounced back and forth. And that's how we work well off each other is I say something Nick's like, Oh yeah, that makes me think of this. I'm like, Oh, that makes me think of this. Yeah. And we just kind of go like that. Cause you need that. You need, you can't have two like nuts and bolts people and, or two dreamers, like you got to have a mix. And again, it's so, not like Mike, you can't do anything. Like, no, no, we're a, a both a mix of yeah. both. But like, I tend to lean more towards nuts and bolts. He tends to lean more towards ideas, Wins. and so it balances really, which I think is why we've been successful, is because our balance, on top of the fact that we get along because we're brothers, uh, our balance out. is like perfectly aligned. Yeah, 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 and that that's real important, absolutely. So, so then when you say. Um, you know, you were bringing something new, which you guys have, and I think your your content is fantastic. It, it is fresh, it is new, it's it's really well written, really good stuff. Um, what is the balance with do? And I know it's kind of like a fine line with this next question I'm coming up with, but doing the stuff you want to do as opposed to perhaps what the audience wants. And I know it's one of those kind of things that sort of goes hand in hand, right? You know what I mean? Like yeah. you created this, so you, you gathered a following, but do you, are you able to stray off of it because you want to be creative and do something different or are sometimes you stuck in that's what the audience wants. So how was your content determined what you're going to create? It's a good question. A good question. I mean, I think that's something that people one. with success, you see a lot of big channels that are known for doing a certain thing. It's hard to stray away from yeah, that because can't really. people are yeah. expecting a certain type of show. Uh, Especially everything. with YouTube. YouTube is so hyper-focused. Yeah. I go to brilliant. this person because they do this one specific thing. If yeah. I want to go watch something else, I'll go to this person who does that specific yeah. thing, which is a very – Tough world to live in, honestly. Yeah, so I think we we've what we've tried to do as we've gone is we've always tried to um, we a couple things. One, we kind of built our brand is us. That's we yeah, are the common denominator. We will be a part of every video we do. So if we do different things, it's still going to have the same energy and stuff. So that's one thing we've tried to do. Another thing we've tried to do is we've always tried to kind of introduce a new type of video. Uh, a new fun thing that we're doing to sort of let people know that this is going to be an organic, ever-changing mm -hmm. uh, channel. And hopefully people are into that idea that like, I don't know what direction the Murphs are going to go. We have certain things you can kind of expect every yeah. week, but there might be some new crazy idea. Um, and then from there, what we've had to do is figure out, and this is, I think, a key thing, is figure out the balance between business in commerce and art it's like any any entertainment yeah, yeah it's like okay like there's definitely some things nick and i like to make that we think are really cool that, that no are gonna watches. get 700 views yeah because the audience the, the diehards we call you know the people that watch anything and everything that we do are going to watch it and they're going to love it and then other people are like oh that's not what i'm looking for so we have to kind of find when to have those videos set realistic expectations for them. And if it's something that is artistically fulfilling for yes. us, gives us something really strong, know that that's a, that's enough. And that's why that's you're okay. doing it. You're not doing it yeah. for it to do well. That's a bonus if it does, yeah, but you don't need that. And then yeah. you kind of have your bread and butter things that will you know make you more money, get you more views, help grow your channel. So it's it's kind of a constant balance and, and trial and error. Figuring yeah. out you know what do you A, enjoy doing and do that and then see if you can get people that are into it. Yeah. And we're and then just it. not, not getting defeated when there's something that we always joke around, but it's kind of true. We're always saying the thing that you care about the most is the thing that no one will care about. And then this throwaway thing that you make is the thing that everyone loves. <laughs> and it's that. like, and that happens a lot where we put so much work into like something and then like, and you know, people don't really watch it, which is fine, so but it's just like, it's, it's can you, it can crush people and you have to, know that going into it that those there's going to be those letdowns and you have to kind of just keep going because one you will find your audience eventually and yeah. then two it's like that's okay just then make it for you and then just keep and then have some stuff that do top tens we like doing top tens but one of the reasons we do top tens is because they do by People far like the best yeah. on our channel than any of our other videos <laughs> and like luckily we enjoy doing them but we also do them because it it keeps a steady stream of subscribers coming through and views yeah. and stuff like that you know and it's like whereas if we didn't we wouldn't be as big as we were right now because our top tens are consistently our our biggest um source of subscribers you know yeah. and it's like that's just how it is you know that's right. like on the business side luckily we still enjoy doing it but yeah. that's like yeah it's kind of the business side and then right. I, think, 
Yeah, and I think also with the the thing you mentioned, maybe it's the throwaway stuff, like people really like it and it maybe does better than the stuff that's highly produced is because at the end of the day, people just want truth, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. like you, they want you guys, they see you. So when you give them full truth, which you say is just a throwaway thing, yeah. they what they really want because it yeah. really is you. So, but with that being said, one of the things, and again, I, I don't watch all of your stuff. I can't watch all of your stuff. I haven't seen it all, yeah. but, but. Uh, one of the things I really do like and I, uh, is the in focus things you guys do. Mm, and yeah. so I want to I want to talk about that a little bit because um, and maybe help us, the audience, understand how that works. So um, I don't know if Board Game Geek is paying you to do that, if that's something you do. But also I want to talk about is it's not necessarily the crazy, funny brothers Murph. It's you, it, the ways that I really like it because you guys are real sort of professional and, and you know what I mean? It's not that no, you're I know, I know, yeah. what you do. We know how weird we are. Yeah. yeah. No, but it's, it's, it's just really nice. I, yeah. I, I like the briefness of it, your presentation when you do it. And I just think it's fantastic. So you. can you tell us a little bit about that series and how, if it, is it Board Game Geek, how you get paid and maybe some of your other things like that too? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's one thing that we um, really enjoy being able to show people is that like for as goofy as we are and our brand is kind of built on like, we can be silly professional. Dudes, <laughs> like we take what we do really seriously and yeah. we have skills to back up um, our silliness and stuff like that. So uh, the In Focus series is like a super good way to do that. Um, we have like I said, we, we never really um, were interested in doing reviews, classic reviews of games. It just wasn't something that resonated with us. We like watching them and take them in. It's just not yeah. something we wanted to make. But something like an overview, like the In Focus series, we don't attach opinions to any of those videos. They're just an overview, um, was something that we saw as a really fun challenge because it allowed us to um, kind of flex our creative muscles and in terms of writing, we write all the scripts and we kind of like, how can we boil this game down yeah. to like a two to three minute presentation and give you a good feel of what this game is a yeah. jumping off point, if you will. And then how can we shoot it so we can make it super pretty along the yeah. way with really kind of fancy, you know, camera work. How can we make the, the studying we've done yeah. work for yeah, us? Yeah. Um, and so this was something that we um, met up, with Lincoln from Board Game Geek and did a game night. And this was a couple this years was, ago. Uh, October 2018. Yeah, a couple yeah. years ago, almost now. And um, we got to meet them and hang out with him and Nikki and stuff and, and played a game. And at the end of that night, Lincoln said, hey, like, uh, we want to do stuff with you guys. Yeah. Like, let's figure out something to do. Um, and that kind of led to a period of... Um, Kind of brainstorming, figuring out like what's something we could do, what's something we could make, what's a what's an interesting type of uh, video, and we kind of all came to this idea of like doing overviews of games, give people a, a quick peek at a game, something where they can sort of see right in, in in just a couple minutes. Am I interested in this thing at all? Yeah. And if so, let me go further to watch an actual review of the game, or go over here to watch a playthrough, or something like that. Like, how can I get into a game without having to invest 35, 45 minutes? Yeah, totally. Um, and so they're commercials. That's what we, that's yeah. how we, we they're, they're movie like, trailers. That's how we think of it. Yeah, it's like, like movie trailers. Commercials are wrong. They're movie trailers. It's like you watch a movie trailer to see if you're interested in a movie. Yeah. That's what these are, and 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 that's how we try to shoot them, and that's why there's such a focus on not only giving you the information, but making it look really good, making sure it's very clear. Mm -hmm. We have, uh, we've really invested in like our equipment to like make, we can get these like really beautiful dolly shots that are very slow, but very clear. And they become more and more artistic. And although we are much more like laid back and professional, uh, it's we still try to have fun. We still try to have humor. We still try to have energy in it. Yeah. And it's something that, um, you know, we, we started work with BGG. Um, you know, we have a partnership with them. We do get paid to do those videos yeah, and which is awesome, which is great. You know, it's awesome. It's been another opportunity that we've, that we've been able to have and it's been wonderful. Um, but we, we were able to more or less kind of make those overviews ourselves. Like I said, we write them all. And so we were kind of like, okay, then we do this. We kind of workshop with Lincoln a little bit, but we kind of hit our stride basically right out the yeah. bat. If you watch the first one to the one now, they're definitely better now, yeah. but the general the structure of them the is basically exactly the same. And so now it's just with editing and with shooting, it's like how creative we can get, what can we get? Can we do this? Can we do this differently? Can we now have like different color masking happen and all this kind of stuff. And so it's been this really fun technical creative venture that we've done yeah that's also just been really cool because we get to talk about a, like a lot of the games we just choose behind us we can talk about a lot of games we love and it's kind of been able to show off a side of us being like hey like 
like Mike said earlier, it's like we're not just those goofballs. Like we can do a lot more than that. We just know that that's like our personalities are our strong we're points. Professional so. goofballs. Yeah, exactly. But we are professionals there, you know. And oh, no, so, no, no, absolutely. Yeah. And, and I know you guys knew what I mean. You, you are yeah, one. No, of, yeah, yeah, we didn't. There's no insult, trust. No, yeah. we, we enjoy being able to show that side. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 really fantastic. So Thank you. so within the board gaming community, unlike maybe not any other, I'm sure there are others, but other uh, kind of professions or uh, groups that I've known. What's good about the board gaming community is, for example, you're able to say, be a consultant or work for the board, for board game geek. Yeah. You're able to be a consultant or work for Dice Tower. You're able to work for Restoration Games. You're able to work for this company. And it's nice how there never seems to be a, nah, don't work with that publisher. Yeah. Really. yeah. yeah. So how, what are your thoughts on that? And it just in general, and have you noticed that it has been pretty much 100% throughout the gaming community, or are there some kind of taboos where lines you don't cross in that essence? Um, it's pretty open, you yeah. know, and I think I mean, that's something that is really cool about the hobby is that it is a small hobby um, compared to many other things out there. Um, so everybody kind of knows everybody, and from the very beginning, you know, we were able to meet all the Everybody, you know, yeah. <laughs> including the Dice Tower guys, you, uh, Rado, anybody you could want. And so because of that, there is a sense of the entire community kind of knows the entire community. Um, and so that's been one of the most amazing things about this. That's what's, uh, you know, um, that's the reason why we have been able to make it to where we make it is that Restoration Games early on said like, hey, we're really interested in you. You seem like fun people, people that we... I think align with like, let's find something to do together. Cool. Now we're doing these things, which led us to, you know, go to conventions and meet other people who said, Hey, you seem really cool. We seem to align on some things. Let's do something together. And all it's been for us. And I think this is a way to operate is just be open and honest with people. Um, you know, restoration yeah. games knows that we work with board game geek board game geek knows we work with restoration games. None of that's being hidden. Um, yeah. and everyone for the most part has been like really, really supportive of, yeah, cause there's no reason not to. Yeah. Like I think a lot of people, a lot of publishers, particularly in the board game industry seem to realize that like, if Success one of them is, is doing good, everyone's doing good. Yeah. Like, like us working with multiple people is good for them because then they say like oh i know those guys i've seen them on these videos like it, it's like it's having that being like exclusively with one person isn't necessarily the best thing for anybody honestly it's 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 good to be seen in multiple different places and that's kind of like what we've like we, we kind of got asked recently like what's your guys's business plan like what's your business plan we've always kind of been like i don't know like we just like our whole thing is like we like making stuff together and we want to collaborate with people we like and that's kind of what we do. Yeah. Like we make stuff together, but then we work with Restoration Games because we like working with them. We work with Gen Con because we like working with them. We work with BG because we like working with them. We work with other publishers too because we like working with them. And there's just never been, I think it comes down to like, in terms of like taboos, there's, I think there's probably is some, I think they probably don't need to be there if they're there. I think everyone just needs to be like, yo, this isn't like me working with this person doesn't affect me working with you at all. So there's no issue. And and yeah. then, and most people seem to get that. Like yeah. we, we haven't really had any issues where a publisher was like, okay, you can't go work with this that we've right. never really had. And if they did, we'd be like, okay, but then we're not going to work with you. Like, sorry. <laughs> like it's, it's, right. and I think no one, there's very little of that. It seems at least that it's we've come across. And yeah. I hope that doesn't go away because it's, it's very nice as, as for, everybody, for everybody. Yeah. It's nice, especially since it trickles from the top, right? We see mm -hmm. from the very top. If you look at, you know, BGG, which is kind of, you know, board game central on the internet in the world. I, yeah. Yeah. And as you mentioned, the you know largest convention, at least here in America, and I'm sure Spiel or Essen is the same way, where if it trickles from the top all the way down to just us sitting at a table and yeah. everybody can collaborate and do things together. It just even illustrates more how much of a wonderful hobby this is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I'd like to, because we're getting close to the end here, I'd mm -hmm. like to, from the point where you're like, okay, Nick, um, yeah, we're going to see how long you can hang out and see if we can do this, and then Mike coming in and you guys doing it full time now. I'd like to maybe just say, what are some of the things, looking back at that point to now, that you're really proud of that you've accomplished, mm -hmm. say, uh, with your brand, the Brothers Murph, and also the second part of the question would be, what are some of the plans for the future? Sure. Um, uh, what are we proud of, man? Nothing, nothing, nah. nothing's good enough. No, <laughs> it's all we're, um, I'm just proud that we went for it. Yeah. Like, I mean, that's what I was going to say the exact same thing. Two yeah. weeks out, Nick's just like, 
cool. I have no job. My whole company's closing. And yeah. like, that's a, a scary moment. Yeah. That's a, that's a moment you're like, uh, I'm about to go on vacation. I'm going to spend some money. I don't know, but you know, and uh, pretty quickly, I think we both said like, this is an opportunity. This yeah. is a sign. We should go for this right now. And like, that's not always the easy decision to make. So I think that the thing I'm mostly proud of personally um, is that we have always carried ourselves with a confidence about our ability. I've never been in doubt throughout this whole process that we can deliver, we mm -hmm. can deliver the goods, whether or not people are into what we deliver, you know, that's, that that's was not our hands mark. at this right. point. But yeah. we said, you know what? I believe in ourselves yeah. and we kind of continually done that. And then as we've kind of, it's become more professional and business minded in some ways, we have always kind of returned to a belief in ourselves be true to ourselves, speak our truth. Like you're talking about people are seeking that kind of thing. Stay true to what we're interested in um, as we go forward. Yeah. That's what I'm proud of. Yeah. I would say I'm, I'm really proud of uh, our, our live streaming stuff. We do stuff on yeah. Twitch and, and now again, a lot of this is unfortunately, I mean, fortunately for this, but unfortunate, the circumstances is kind of due to COVID, but it's just when we started streaming on Twitch, uh, there were a couple people who would stream there, but that was there's no one streaming board on Twitch with except for us, another channel called Twist Gaming, and a couple other people. And it's kind of grown and, and become bigger. And and so I, cool. I do feel like we have, along with a couple other people, have really been one of the driving forces for like you can play board games live and they can be entertaining, you yeah. know, because board games live isn't always that fun to watch, but we've always been like, no, it can be fun to watch. It can be entertaining. Make it a can. show. And we're like, no, we're just going to keep doing it. We're going to keep doing it. We've been streaming now for three years. And I'm really proud of that. Um, and, I, and I'm also, it's it kind of a weird way, but I am proud that we have uh, moved, like not necessarily moved past the Binding Stress Magic because we haven't, but like we have worked very hard, particularly in the last year and a half or so to like get our, quality of our videos kind of up to snuff and really try to make them higher and higher and higher. And I think that's been recognized recently. I think with the in focus is, and we've just been getting a lot more comments recently, like, wow, like the quality this on this yada really yada was well. so good and yada yada. And I was, I'm just glad that like, we're kind of, we're not just like the blah, crazy goofy guys. Like we now, I feel like have gotten, we're still that, but we've also been seen what as other stuff. Say recently, someone said we have meticulous. <laughs> no, it was, oh gosh, shot, hold on. I, it, it was, was meticulously shot utter nonsense. And I was like, that is it was, probably the highest praise. Uh, it was my favorite comment we've ever gotten. <laughs> yeah, and it was, uh, this is the highest, this is the highest quality utter nonsense. This is the highest production quality utter nonsense. Yeah. And I love it. And I was because, like, exactly. That's exactly yeah, what I want. We want to make people laugh. We don't want to take it too seriously, but we take our silliness very seriously. Yeah, we work really <laughs> hard. Yeah, and it's like, yeah. And in terms of the future, um, as always, we've dreamed big. Uh, man, some things we want to do, this was going to be happening this year. And then obviously we can't go outside, but one thing we want to do uh, and plan to invest our kind of energy into is doing super games. So the first one we want to do is take flick them up and blow it up life size where now we are all the bandits and stuff. And we're throwing Frisbees in a kind of life size town. That's just all facades. It's just like little fronts yeah. and things. And playing and like doing, a field, like a football field. Or in like a football that. field yeah. or playing Valley of the Vikings on slip and slides and just yeah. and taking again, the production value and cranking up the silliness again, yeah. but doing it in a really cool way. Yeah. So there's all sorts of things like that. We want to do tours uh, in RVs and kind of create like a little mobile yeah, that's um, like board game goals. library. Having a travel channel show more or less. Yeah. Where we're just see, in see a mobile board game games. cafe and we just, we just, drive around the US and and stop in places and then you know bring out the games the tables and stuff like that and have yeah. like mobile game days and stuff like that. Yeah. Um and then we started like a playthrough series recently where we stream at the we play a game at the game house which is a board game cafe uh here in LA and we've been doing that which has been really cool. Mm -hmm. And then yeah it's just like we we've always loved playing games in specific places. So we'll go to like the natural history museum and play evolution. So we want to take that like on a global scale someday. We're going yeah, to play travel like, and go play Taj Mahal at the Taj Mahal. Like again those are all way way out there but it's like we we've always loved doing stuff like that yeah. and um, we like to dream out in that direction and try to get as far in yeah. that direction as we we're gonna can get go. that rv and we're gonna make yeah. we're gonna make that series happen that would be 
fantastic. That, that sounds absolutely fantastic. I would love to see that. Well, yeah. you know, you guys, um, I just want to say, and honestly, and I'm not blowing smoke just because, uh, you, you know, you came on the show and, and did this, but uh, you, you guys are, you really are a breath of fresh air in uh, the gaming nice. community with the, your content, all the things you do. And I do appreciate what you do and your, in your lovely guys. So if, <laughs> if people haven't had a chance to meet them, uh, they are, they are lovely. They are fun. Um, because again, that's what's so good about the board gaming community, right? That people who are like your, who are the celebrities, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, are all genuine, just nice people. Yeah. So, and uh, Nick and Mike, you two are uh, two of the nicest in the industry. Thank nice, you so thank much. You. So last, before we go, I just want to make sure you guys, I know I've been putting up your YouTube and your Twitch mm -hmm. throughout the interview, but Appreciate please that. let us know sort of everywhere that people can get um, a chance to experience the Brothers Murph. Yeah. Okay. So YouTube, youtube.com yeah. slash the Brothers Murph is where you'll right. find weekly videos. We do three videos a week, including yeah. our metagame minute series where we talk that's about something that's been on our mind. Yeah. Uh, so that's a big spot. That's where we have all our top tens and different things like that. That's all on YouTube. The other place we are other half of the time is on Tuesday and Thursday nights at 6 p.m. West Coast time. We're live at twitch.tv slash the Brothers Murph. Now that's been like you said, Nick, one of the most fun things ever. We've created yeah. such an amazing community of people that watch yeah. us, that support. We're the most welcoming people on Twitch. We say it and mean it. Uh, Damn people right. give subs and things. It's just the coolest group of people. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of the two halves of what we do. Outside of that, you'll see us post pictures on Instagram at the Brothers Murph. Uh, you'll see us tweet thing. stuff at Brothers Murph. Um, yeah. And then we have a Facebook. And then check us out uh, BGG. Check them out. We do our yeah. focus stuff. All, all that's on, on BGG. BGG. Uh, we pop up the dice tower sometimes, but you can kind of find us. At a con, yeah. check out either Board Game Geek or Restoration Games. You'll see us at their booth. Yeah. Uh, that's most of the places. But yeah. uh, again, YouTube and Twitch, especially Twitch, if you want to hang out and talk to us live, we're all about connecting with the yeah. audience there. It's so fun. Yes, and you guys always have an open invitation, as you know, to Dice Tower West. So oh, when yeah. it oh, yeah. goes back again. It's my favorite convention. I'm not just oh. saying that because you're here. It's my favorite convention. Yeah, I love Dice Tower either, West. Tim. <laughs> no, it's my it's favorite. So good. I love the Dice Tower. The Dice Tower cons have a great vibe. And MeepleCon is the only place I could say it had a better vibe. And now they're just one, and, but they're ah. bigger. And it's just like, and it's Vegas. I love Vegas. And it's there like, you go. yeah. It's local yeah. enough for us where I'm like, at least it's, it's close. It's like every con is so far away from LA. It's like they're Dice all the big ones are nowhere near thing. us. So it's like, oh, I love Dice Tower West is the best con in the world. So good. Yeah, 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 good. And you, like I said, you guys will always be there. And we got great big plans. Probably yeah. not for 21, but you know. at least 22. <laughs> what are you going to do? Yeah. What are you going to yeah. do? But again, guys, thank you so much for spending this time with me. I really appreciate it. And uh, we'll talk to you guys soon. All right. See you later. See you all soon. Well, there you go, folks. And thanks again for joining us for another episode of Meepavo Meets. The Brothers Murph, as I said, are two of the nicest guys in the industry. They have great, great content on their YouTube channel, on Twitch. And especially, like I said, just they're in focus things. You got to go to Board Game Geek uh, and see that. But it's always on the front page. And they just give, like they said, a nice little movie trailer of uh, certain games. And it's it's really cool. It's one of my favorite things uh, to watch, really, in board gaming. It's really, really good stuff, that info. Stuff. I, I just love that. Um, but anyway, thanks again for joining us for another edition of Meepable Meets, and we'll see you guys soon.